I'm very happy to introduce our next speaker. Um, Douglas Eck is a research scientist at Google, and he is the head of the Magenta group um, in Google Brain. So today, Doug will be talking about some recent projects of the group. So welcome, Doug. Excellent. Is this microphone working? It sounds like it is. OK. Uh, happy Saturday, everyone. This is um, hopefully going to be an enjoyable talk. I, um, I'm going to give you a bit of an overview of some things that we're doing in Magenta, a project that I'm organizing at Google Brain to um, look at, at some things having to do with music and art. But since this is about engagement, I thought it was really important that I, that I had a slide. <laughs> um, I use this without permission, so <laughs> you get permission. Now, actually, I thought this was such a great definition of engagement that I sat and took a photo and uploaded it to my talk. To my <laughs> Being compelled or drawn in, connected to what's happening, and interested in what happened then. And, um, um, the work that we're doing is computational, but I, I want everybody to actually have this definition in mind as we're talking about some of the issues, because I really do think uh, the joke of taking the photograph aside, that it's a really nice way to look at the problem. I also want to think about uh, not just um, computers making music, but um, music in general. And so I have a lot of musical examples for you. And uh, I'm, also, I, I'm also a pianist, and uh, I like to... to um, Compose sometimes. And so before we jump in, let's just, I want you to listen in terms of engagement. I want you to listen to this piece, very short, and I want you to think about how, how it engages you and try to quickly form some opinions about it. Okay? Maybe let's listen to it one more time. It's always good to habituate a little bit. Maybe pay attention to the phrasing. All right. So um, that was a short piece of piano music, right? Um, could you hear expressive timing? Could it? Did it feel like it was played by someone? I mean, even though it's it's MIDI. Mm -hmm. Okay, so, well, we have, we have pianos that pick up on these things, right? You know, the technology is there. Maybe even behind us, yeah, that's a disc Um Okay, now let's change expectations a little bit. Um, instead, what if I told you that that piece of music was written not by me, but by uh, an AI algorithm? And in fact, that's true. So this was written by um, uh, a model that we recently put up on our blog, um, and in some sense performed as well, because the model's generating not just the score, but the expressive timing and the dynamics behind the playing. Okay? So now I've given that away. This little snippet of music is actually written by a computer. And let's listen to it again, and I'm curious if your expectations change and if your impression of the music changes at all. <laughs> So show of hands, how many of you think the music's less valuable because it's made by a computer? It's, it's okay if you feel that way. A lot of people do. Right? How many of you don't care one way or the other what made the music? Okay. That's actually really an interesting finding. Um, I, a lot more hands came up. Um, now what if I told you that this algorithm, in fact, the way it works is that it just gets to listen to a lot of music performed by real pianists, real people, right? So it just gets to listen over and over again to music performed on a disc clavier, just like this, a, a piano that can capture the, the hammer velocities. Um, does that devalue it, or does that make it more valuable? I mean, does that sound like cheating? Is it cheating that this model is just kind of rehashing music that is made by other composers and performed by other pianists? Who thinks it's less valuable? Who thinks it's more valuable? It's hard for it to be more valuable, but I'll give you that. It's maybe equally valuable. <laughs> um, I guess the one thing that I would point out is that uh, it's, it's worth keeping in mind that these models are really driven by us, by, by our music, and by the history of what we have. But it's also worth noting that that's what musicians do too, right? Like, we copy each other 
the first thing that you're doing when you're trying to play a piano is playing some piece of music, and your teacher is then saying, do this, don't do that. So all of art sort of works this way, and as we're thinking about um, some of the issues that I'll come to in this talk, um, it's, it's worthwhile trying to keep in mind what we're really trying to do, which is connect these machine learning algorithms, these AI algorithms, actually to ourselves, and to use them as, as tools, as jumping off points for saying new things. And again, this is what ties back to engagement. I think we can make a very strong argument that what will be engaging to us is something that makes sense. In the sense of music, it makes sense to us musically. And, and maybe we add something new. But if you look at the progression of art and the progression of music, there's really not that much new added every year, right? In art, you know, we don't jump from like 15th century portraiture to Coons in one generation. Like, it's a bunch of little hops. And so maybe what we can do is um, make small hops with technology that enable us to try some new things. And, and that's really what this talk is about. So the project that I'm um, happy to say this project's been public for about a year. I did talk about it last year a little bit, and uh, it's called Magenta, which was um, a purposely vague uh, name so we could do whatever we wanted to, but if it helps, MAG is Music and Art Generation, and TA is TA. And it's, a, it's an open source project. <laughs> and, uh, now, a team, maybe that. We never really knew what the, that, that, that stood for. Um, and there's really uh, a couple of main axes to what we're doing, and they both involve the public. So the first and I think most important axis of what we're doing is kind of trying to drive an open source uh, uh, effort to engage musicians and artists and also creative coders, people that think of code as something creative, which I do, and, and come up with some tools and some, some new ways to think about generating media. And then the other thing we're doing is, is actually research. So um, it's really cool that Google like actually pays. I get paid to do this, which is super <laughs> cool. Like, but we're also, um, I think in a more serious way, we're trying to drive the research in using machine learning uh, in a generative fashion to generate new things. It might be text, it might be images, it might be new molecules for drug discovery. We actually have a paper where we generate music and molecules for drug discovery in the same paper using the same algorithm. So, so um, you know, we're, we're, we're working in a, in, a, in a lot of areas. If you want to follow this, if there's any kind of call to action, it's, um, it's the shortest link to our work is g.co slash magenta. And uh, you can also just search Google Magenta. Um, this Venn diagram is also important to me because um, it, I think, highlights, should be pretty obvious, I guess, since we're calling ourselves a machine learning group, that we'll do some machine learning. Um, but it's always been f uh, foremost, uh, front, front and center for us, that um, if we're going to work on media like music or art, that, that we need to care about people. And we, you know, the only way we know if these models are any good is if people like them, right? And by the way, interesting thought experiment, you know, what would success look like for us? Um, what would success look like for a project like this? Right? I mean, in my mind, it would be that someone comes along and uses this technology to make some new art or some new music, and that some people like it. Right? And it's actually, um, it's not enough that some people like like one little snippet because it turns out people like random music. So you know you can just throw shiny things at people and we're like crows or ravens and we go oh, shiny thing I want that. But that's not usually engaging, not long term. And so success for me would be if an artist were working with our our algorithms. And by the way, I don't think the algorithms alone are that interesting. I don't think people care about just kind of pushing a button and watching computers make art. I think art and music are about communication. Right, it's about like having ideas and convincing people of things. So I mean, there are always artists and musicians in the loop here, um, but that someone comes up with some new, slightly different form of, of of music or art that people like, and that people hate, right? Because there's really nothing new in this world artistically that doesn't like kind of piss off the previous generation, right? So, I mean, whatever happens here will probably be like every other, you know, revolutionary or even slightly revolutionary art form where, you know, most people will hate it, but if you're lucky, there'll be some passionate group of people that love it and, and move it forward. Um, so, that's what we're doing. And also, um, I think, importantly, so the person on the right here is is a really fantastic guitarist named St. Vincent. Um, fun fact, I would also use a picture of Jimi Hendrix, but I'm, I'm unable to find a really good picture of Jimi Hendrix that's not, why we don't have to pay someone to use it, and since we're Google, we have to care about that. So you can also think of Jimi Hendrix in that. 
And this guy on the left is Les Paul. He's one of the people credited with inventing the electric guitar. Right. And uh, I, think, I think it's important for those of us that are doing technology in the space of art and music to be aware of the fact that we're probably doing a little bit more of what this person's doing than what this person's doing. Um, you know, the electric guitar was, probably not surprisingly, if you look back at the history, more or less trying to be a loud acoustic guitar so that it could compete with, with, with other instruments on a stage. And the engineers worked really hard to keep these guitars from distorting, right? <laughs> and tried really hard to make the pickups be nice and quiet, right? So distortion's a failure case. Buzzy pickups are a failure case. And now what do you have? Like, you know, you've got a bunch of, like, you know, people in dad bands like me trying to get this tube sound so that the guitar will distort correctly and ripping out clean pickups and putting in humbuckers that are really noisy. You have people like Jimi Hendrix who comes along and takes and completely breaks the rules and, and takes what was engineered for one purpose and reuses it for another purpose. And I think you can argue pretty convincingly that this is part of art. This is part of what we do. We kind of push the boundaries of what's there. That's part of the statement. And so I'm pretty happy to be an engineer in all of this and try to build out some new things. And I would be perfectly happy with a success story that someone came along and did something with our work that we didn't expect that in fact was you know, not working as intended. Why did you do that um, sort of background? Mm -hmm. All right. So this is not an incredibly technical talk, but I do want to talk a little bit about neural networks. How many people have heard of a neural network? How many people have a neural network in their brain? Um, <laughs> Depends what you mean by neural network. Um, this is not pretend neuroscience in our world. We think of these as machine learning models that are really good at learning from data. Um, fundamentally, you might in this case have a, uh, uh, maybe I'll move over here, you might have an image and it's pixels. The pixels uh, are um, uh, sensed or read in at some layer in a neural network. These units all do little bits of computation. And then these weighted connections move layer wise through the network. When there are lots of layers, it's called a deep network. So you may have heard the phrase deep learning. And usually there's uh, the hand of God out there saying uh, they know the right answer. And she says, no, this image is a, it's a dog. It doesn't look like a dog to me. I actually have a slide where I put cat because I couldn't tell what it was. And then uh, we, we adjust these weights in the neural network to do a slightly better job next time of predicting dog instead of cat. Okay, so. These are the models we're working with. They turn out to be actually surprisingly effective at a lot of tasks. So the speech recognition uh, that's being used at Google is, and, and neural networks, the translation, which has gotten amazingly better in the last year, thanks to neural networks, is fundamentally pumping English words in, calculating a bunch of math with these weights, and pumping out French on the other side. And uh, they, they tend to be very data absorptive. So if you have a lot of data, if you have high dimensional data, and by high dimensional, I mean, for example, there are a lot of pixels here to look at, and each pixel value could be thought of as a dimension in a vector, um, then these models tend to be really good at, at learning, uh, learning the underlying structure. I'll walk too far away from the screen. Okay. I'll just hang this shut up. There we go. Now, I want to talk a little bit about a specific neural network because it's the one that you heard, and make some comments about that. So, the music we heard was from a recent uh, model that we just published to our blog and we'll be coming up with a longer paper later. And it's something called the recurrent neural network. And you can see the recurrence in the graph here with the self-connecting arrow. So it's also a neural network, um, but it's trying to learn an internal state that functions as some sort of dynamic memory so that as it's moving forward, it's sort of um, in, a, in, a, in a causal way paying attention to what came before. And in this case, it's, it's listening to the music and it's trying to predict what to do next. And um, the music that we had in this case were, were um, recordings on a piano of, of pianists playing a bunch of, of piano music, right? some jazz, some classical. And they were real performances. So we had, I think it's crucial to remember, it wasn't just the score, but it's a performer's rendition of the score, including all of the slowing down and speeding up and the changes in velocity that you see. And to capture that data, we tried something quite naive. Um, uh, Ian Simon and, and Suggy, who's speaking later, worked on this project. Um, the model at some point in time simply predicts if there's a note coming. Oh, incidentally, this is probably a better representation. Not, it's not really a score, it's just like a, called a piano roll. Here's the piano keys, and here's whether a note is on or off. 
and color gives you an indication of how loud these notes are. And uh, at any given point in time, the model is just going to predict, should I generate a note on? Should I push down a piano key? How loud should that be? That's our velocity. And uh, maybe, or should I turn a note off at this point in time? So should I lift up the key? And then, should I advance the clock? So I move forward in time. And so the model can generate as many notes as it wants to at any given point in time. It can turn off as many notes as it wants to. And it can move forward in time. And it, can, it can even get it wrong, as you'll see. But, but that's, that's what the model is trying to do. And uh, this is what the output of, of our model might look like. Uh, so it's basically writing a score and performing it at the same time because it's generating all of the articulation, all of the, uh, maybe that's not the right word, um, all of the velocities and such. And um, I want to play a couple more pieces for you because I think it's worth spending time on. Um, one thing to, to note, this model is, is really just a stepping stone towards another model. This model is um, not trained conditionally. And, and by that I mean the model is simply seeing these musical performances in MIDI and trying to predict what's coming next. But it doesn't ever see the genre of the music or the year it was composed or any other um, conditioning variables that a person could use creatively, like, hey, I want to turn on the, the you know, Baroque button or whatever, and we're adding that. And we're also working on models that you can actually sample from um, and make new performances with um, in a more controlled way. But at the same time, I think there's something evocative about um, these samples. I'll sam I want to play a few of them so you can hear, and I really want you to listen to what you find interesting, and it's fine what you find boring or what you find annoying, because in the end, it's whether people find this interesting at all. And, and another way to think about it is, would these ever form the building blocks of something more interesting? These, these aren't art, in my mind. These are chunks of interestingness that might be used by someone to do something with. Um, but uh, I still think they're cool, and I'm going to play a couple. First, I'm going to replay what I repeat, repeated for you, because any jazz musician is just repetition is a winner, right? You're going to love this one, because I've made you listen to it three times. But I'll also let it continue. Okay. So here's number one. Check the model learns to play fat, uh, shorter and, and harder notes with more velocity for, for fast passages because it's so prevalent. The hand does this. A couple more. too because 
because it, it's a really nice example of the way the model is kind of moving time forward. So if, um, I almost think it sounds like, anybody familiar with the, the jazz pianist Thelonious Monk? Who had this kind of like loping timing style? Listen for how the model doesn't at all get the metronome right. Like it actually lopes and jumps around. You can call it an error if you want, but it's also kind of interesting that it's, that we have this kind of fine-grained timing uh, at, at play. last one I'll play for you, I think it's the right one. I hope you don't mind me taking time to, do, to play this. I think it's a good way to spend time. This, this last one is actually one of the earlier samples uh, from the model that Ian on the team worked on. And he, he, he didn't actually predict velocities for this one. And I think my, listening to samples from that model, it kind of makes it easier for the model to try some other things because it has less that it has to predict. So it, it was never shown the velocities and it doesn't predict them. So these are all going to be, the notes are all going to be the same velocity, which I think you'll pick up on. But um, I feel, well, I'll let you judge for yourself whether it's structured any more tightly. Actually, it was a tune in my head. Da, 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 da. It sounds like church lights. But I hope, could you guys hear that the, 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 didn't it sound flat? Like the, the, the velocities were all the same. How many people thought it sounded flat? Like you could actually tell. Yeah. Which, is, which shows you that these, you know, I think a lot of people think that um, these timing and dynamics and performance are like, well, I'm not a musical expert. You know, I can't hear, everybody can hear it. Like it's so important. And so being able to pick up on some of this, I think is great. And, um, I think furthermore, the, the, the main point that I would make about this work is, you know, the model's really simple. The model is basically trying to just predict when notes are being pressed on a piano keyboard and when to lift them up and to move forward, how loud they are. What's, what's interesting about this is that we had data that actually looks a little bit more like, almost in my mind, I think it's closer to being motion capture data. You know, data that's watching what the body is doing in, a, in an artistic setting than it is like having a microphone in the room. Because even though it's indirect, what you're really getting are the, the velocities that are generated when the pianist moved those keys. And I think the more data that we have that actually captures performances, the more interesting it's going to be to learn from them and to be able to have, in some sense, the machine learning models communicating with us in our own terms, in a very real way, in our own terms. A more mathematical way to think about it is that Audio is very high dimensional, right? In, a, in, a, in, a, in one second of CD quality audio, stereo, you have you know, 80,000 some odd numbers at play. But like, when we create music, we're actually working in a much lower dimensional space of moving our arms, moving our fingers. When I'm talking even, I'm, you know, I'm making a buzzing sound with my vocal track and then and shaping with some articulatory gestures my, my, my vocal track. So maybe living in these lower dimensional spaces of brush strokes and of, of um, musical actions we'll, we'll get a little bit further. Okay, I'm going to move on. I don't need this because I did them for you live. Oh, and by the way, before you all go home thinking, oh my god, uh, we solved music. <laughs> um, this is so cool. These are some of the performance RNN uh, plots at the top, right? And this is a, a Chopin etude at the bottom. And like, even just with your eyes, even just looking visually at the symmetries and the structures found in a piece of music composed by a master. You can see that the work that we're doing is so far away. <laughs> so, so don't despair, folks. There's, you know, <laughs> the, it's basically an infinitely deep problem. And uh, the stuff that we're doing with machine learning, I'm thoroughly convinced, remains in, 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 grounded in, in, in tools. In, and expressive tools that we can use for, for making statements ourselves. 
Now, even though this is about music, I wanted to spend a little time talking about a project that has to do with drawing, because I think it illustrates really well one of the main issues that I have that I tried to elucidate here, which is about learning from the right kind of data actually gives you interesting output. So this is another project that we did. Um, the first author is David Ha, who's a Google Brain resident. And he, he taught uh, a machine learning model to learn how to draw. Okay. And I want to do a little bit of machine learning here with you, because I think this does a really nice job of showing some basic ideas of what you might do with a generative model, a model that's actually trying to generate something different. And so let's look at this funny, think of this as an hourglass turned on its side. And crucially, this thing in the middle, uh, the, the green thing, which is Z, but for, for reasons that have to do with the Canadian dominance in machine learning is called Z by everyone, so we're going <laughs> to use Z. Um, Z is some compressed representation of something. It's not big enough to memorize all of the data moving through it, and so it's forced to only store what's important. It's a very strong philosophical discussion in our field about what important means. Does it something, something to do with entropy and encodability? Is it something to do with disentangling sources of variance? What does it all mean? Um, we'll leave that alone. But um, what we're going to talk about is taking a drawing, in this case a drawing of a cat, because that's what we do at Google is talk about cats. And this is, these are actually the strokes of a pen or a finger on a, 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 a touch sensitive screen or moving the mouse. And this um, cat drawing has been encoded using a recurrent neural network that instead of predicting what musical notes are coming next, is predicting where the pen will move. And it's moving through this um, space Z, which is forced to try to remember as much as it can in one vector about that drawing. Okay? And crucially, when we train Z, we not only train it to be able to reproduce that drawing, but also to have good statistical properties. Namely, that uh, when we sample from it, it samples as if it's Gaussian. So this is called a, a variational model, where one of the training costs, this is the only math we'll talk about, one of the training costs is kind of forcing Z to have a particular shape. Gaussian shape. And then we decode it using uh, another recurrent neural network, and we recreate our cat, right? Or moreover, I think, if you compare the two cats, we recreate what the model thinks is important about cats. Look at what's different between the encoded cat and the decoded cat. Oh, <laughs> wrong version of the slide. I, <laughs> it's really <laughs> embarrassing. This cat is supposed to be missing an ear, and I fixed the slide in another slide deck. Forget what I just said. Even if you're missing the ear, the cat will decode with two ears. That's so embarrassing. All right. um, and here's the full model for those of you that like to look at graphs. Um, fundamentally, this is uh, the same neural network architecture I showed you before, where the, the nodes are, are blocks, of, blocks of neurons are shown in these boxes, and we're looking at the, the graph of, 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 of what's being computed. OK. so. I think also we're spending a little bit of time on is where the data came from. Um, we have a, a game that was released by Google um, by a really cool group called Creative Lab. And they took an image classifier that we already had and they said, let's, let's, play, um, let's let people play Pictionary against the image classifier, see if they can trick it. And so I'm supposed to draw a stove in under 20 seconds. I got it. So I'm going to start drawing a stove. I see shoe, or suitcase, or square. I see mug, or soda can, or toaster, or castle, or oven. I see calendar, or I'm washing so machine, or gift. I see water, this. or alarm clock, or out. house plant. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'm done. Sorry, I couldn't get it. I can get street lights. I get street lights. I see circle, or potato, or snowman, or food. I see telephone, or necklace, oh, or on. microphone, or <laughs> I see grapes, or bear, or traffic light, or power outlet. Oh, traffic light! I did a traffic light. Okay. So I see stoplight, or ring, or soda can, so or like, computer mouse. I see music note, or anvil. Sorry, I couldn't get it. Draw an anvil. Okay, can I draw an anvil? Is it like this? I see moon, or circle, or peanut, or mustache, or garden hose. I see shoe, or steak, or helmet, or mushroom, or mouth. I see planet, or hamburger, or frog. I see bottle cap or right, sea so, turtle. <laughs> I do want to quit. All right, please play yourself. It's called Quick Draw. So, um, after three months, this was launched and people were playing it like crazy. We decided we wanted to use the data for machine learning purposes. So, we had to delete all of that data because we hadn't told people we were going to keep it. And we put really clearly, hey, we're going to use this, help teach machine learning models to, to do this. And um, 
people just play and play and play and play this, this game. And, and so, and, and what we're remembering is not just the, the pixels of what they did, but the actual drawing order of things, right? And so, if you go, um, okay, so we'll come back to that. Um, I'm trying to watch time, I'm okay. So let's keep moving. Um, so some more points to me. So we took that data and trained the neural network to generate new drawings. And so for example, here's the yoga class. Um, <laughs> for real, all of these, all of these things on the right are generated by a neural network. They're all what a generative model thinks is yoga. Right? <laughs> and, and furthermore, furthermore, the color, the color that you're seeing um, is actually indicating temperature, which is a term having to do with when we sample from the model, do we only want to sample from the most probable space of that model? Just getting, you know, the most standard yoga, like the ones you're seeing at the top there? Or do we actually want to explore parts of the model that are less probable, higher temperature, it's like turning up the heat, right? And so you see the higher temperature yoga poses are like completely destroying any idea of what the human body is capable of. <laughs> right? You can do, we could all stand up and stretch and you could probably do some low temperature yoga, but we're not doing high temperature yoga here. Um, furthermore, because these models are trained to be, um, remember I talked about this variational model where we have this extra funny math idea of trying to make the, um, the generations be Gaussian when we sample from them? This actually forces the model to explore the entire space of possibilities, not just, not just the most probable modes on the distribution. And so we can, for example, take human drawn images, move them through the encoder decoder, and then that gives us the, the encoded embeddings, the Zs. And then we can generate new Zs and sample the space. So what you're seeing, all of these, are the, the ideas that we're actually moving smoothly. Can we move smoothly from this space to this space, right? Here's the decoded version. And in fact, we, you know, we can because it's a well-behaved space. And we're trying to do the same thing with music. So the idea would be like you as a musician, you might play something in, and that gives us the musical equivalent of one of those faces. And then we can explore the space around that, that musical face, and you can listen to other ideas. That's work in progress. So, um, also, um, here was the point I was trying to make when I had my slide wrong. Um, these models, and again, you can just think about music now. It's, th these are about images, but it's really not important, I think. Um, these models, they generalize. They don't have enough memory to store this data. They're forced to pull out what's important from this data. And so, for example, if you, if you, if, if you take a pig and you give it eight legs, and you encode it, and then you decode it, what comes through that Z is a pig with four legs. It doesn't have enough memory or it doesn't have enough capacity to store all eight legs. Of course, it doesn't know what legs are, right? It's just looking at these stroke deltas, right? The delta pen movements. Um, if you take a, a picture of a truck, exactly this truck, and you move it through the classifier or the model trained on pigs, you get this. Right? Like this, this is a pig truck. There's no other word for it. Like I could not, if you, like I, I could challenge you all, like draw me a pig truck. I'm like, no way, are you going to do as well as this? I'm sorry, it's super cool. Um, and at the same time, it's just not perfect, right? Here's, here's a toothbrush, and this is what it looks like to reconstruct through the cat. That's a cat toothbrush. It's kind of gibberish. And here was the point that I was trying to make um, here, that like at the same time, it does a pretty good job of, of grabbing common things and, you know, you get the canonical cat. Here's the canonical cat without the whisker. It throws the whisker back in. So that's what I was trying to have in my first slide. Mm. So I think, I think this direction is really interesting, this idea that we would want to encode into a variational generative model with a Z. Think of that as like this reduced hourglass. And that hopefully, you know, if we've trained it right, it's sort of remembering what's important about the data. And, and that's a very creative thing to think about because in choosing data, and choosing how models are trained, and choosing what we actually want to work with, this gives us a, a lot of creative, um, uh, a number of creative axes. Oh, and finally, um, this is real math, like for real. If these, this is math in the space of Z, and then decoded. So you take the Z for this cat head, and you add it to the Z for this pig body, but you subtract the pig head, and you get a cat body, <laughs> which is what you should get, right? And this, in the geometry of the space. So basically I'm saying, like, give me a body that's not a pig and add it to the cat head. Or, um, pig, here's the pig, pig, pig body, give me a head but not a cat head, and you get your pig head. <laughs> so this is not fake data, these are actually run through Z, um, and uh, it's kind of interesting. Okay, you can try this yourself. You can try starting drawings and we'll complete them for you. This is all available on our blog. Um, and with... Um, 
I'm actually, how much time do I have total? Okay, so I'm not going to talk about this because I can't get into it and do it justice. <laughs> all right, all right, I'll talk about it. Fine, nope, you don't get any questions. All right, so um, same idea, but with audio. Okay, exactly, exactly the same idea. So you have a generative model of audio, and you want to generate some musical notes, and you want them to be coherent. So you learn a Z that is trying to for example, encode just enough to make the model able to remember that it's playing a flute, right? So now pigs are flutes, and cats are, are, are um, uh, flugelhorns, and we're in the same space. And because these are variational, again, we can sample from them, and we can move into areas of the space that are not normally uh, explorable. We can do pig trucks, right? So um, here's a bass sound in the original sample. It's just a sample of the bass sound. And here's the reconstruction of the bass sound with, with, uh, with Ensign. It's not going to be perfect, because purposely the model can't memorize the sound, right? That's kind of nicely glitchy. Like, same thing with the flute. Reconstruction of the flute. But now, this is karma. You all know what happens if you just take and average a bass and a flute, your ear keeps them separate, right? They won't, they're not going to fuse, right? This is just an audio space. It's just a bass and a flute. But now in this Z, in the embedding space, right, the model's not able to completely memorize flute, nor is it able to completely memorize bass. And um, so what you get is this. kind of keeps the flute harmonics, but it kind of captures almost the size, the performance shape of a bass, right? It's, it's interestingly, this, these models are trained on the raw waveforms, and they learn a lot about, not just, a, they learn a lot about phase and modulation. And if we try to do the same thing with spectral representations, it doesn't work nearly as well. And so what we can do is sample from these WaveNet models um, via Ensign, and I tried to leave room for questions, but no. And, oh, by the way, what we're learning is um, uh, some sort of temporal embedding. The Z is a little fancy. The Z is not just one big vector, but it's a bunch of small vectors that unfold over time, like a few milliseconds. And so, like, these are the Zs that are learned for a flugelhorn. And they're responsible, well, here's the original flugelhorn, and this is not a spectrogram. Color is phase coherence. So you're seeing that there's, like, all this phase demodulation happening in, at different <coughs> frequencies. And that... The spectral representations trained on this, just they lose that ability to kind of get that modulation sound, that kind of wah, wah, wah sound. But the, the, the way the uh, Ensign model is able to capture some of this. And uh, you can play with this yourself. So I know we didn't have a lot of time. And uh, um, I'm, going to, I'm going to stop there, but I'm going to invite you all to really have a look at our blog. Again, if you go g.co slash magenta, you'll find it. See this button that says blog? And we've been writing about this stuff for a year. And the performance RNN stuff I played for you is here. And the drawing stuff is here that I just talked about. And then this Ensynth stuff that I just talked about is here, including really cool um, guest blog posting from uh, Pareg, from not even from the Magenta team. And, and he did, um, he actually resynthesized, and then I'm going to stop. He, he resynthesized um, like an 808, right? So here's the original 808. And he drove this through Ensign and gets this. But now he can like modulate 808 and a cello at the same time. So here's a cello, a little cello melody. It's, it's, it's really hard to hear because it's run through Ensign, right? But like, so fine, it's a noisy cello, but then he can, um, he can live between cello and 808 and get this. And check out his post. And we're starting to see, this is what I love, is we're starting to see people from outside of our group like taking stuff and playing with it. Like, I wouldn't have thought about doing that. Um, OK, um, I, I would have made a 10 slide talk, but I didn't have time, so I made a 100 slide talk. Mm -hmm. That's a joke, right? Um, I'm out of time. Um, please grab the blog and have a look at what we've done. I think we've done quite a bit in a year. I'm really happy for, for the output of, of Magenta. And um, 
I hope this is interesting. I hope you don't feel cheated by having talked about drawings of pigs and cats. I think there's something to learn even musically from that. And I also hope that you can connect the dots um, back to Yachuk's talk about engagement. Um, fundamentally, this will work if we find ways to connect to people and engage with an audience and that they like it and engage with artists and musicians and that they like it and that they're able to work with it. And I think that's, that's you know, the most important thing you can do if you're trying to use technology artistically. Um, okay, I'm over by a minute now. Thank you guys very much. Actually, do you have time for a few questions before the break? So, um, do you want to pick people or should I? Uh, you can pick. Okay. Um, for the AI that makes the music, um, I was wondering since you put input in like human data, has it ever generated a piece that was beyond human capacity? Um, it can definitely break the. Yeah. <laughs> so yes, I've definitely heard the model play something. Maybe maybe. Uh, um, Sagiv, when he speaks later, can hit at this because he's a pianist and he worked on the project. But it's definitely able of playing things that he can't play, and he's a very good pianist, right? So, um, yes, for sure. Um, how to how to move artistically in that direction is a little tougher, but yeah. yeah. So you trained your your models on essentially audio recordings of. Uh, of, of compositions, easily played by, by a pianist. Uh, it was MIDI. It, it was MIDI. It was MIDI. On a disc clavier, so on a, a, on, a, on a MIDI piano that's actually able to measure the velocities of the hammers and reproduce, you know, pretty well. How would you compare that to what's been done on MusicNet, like at, at uh, UW, for example? I think, I think both are trying to essentially write out the, the encoding of the pieces along with the performances. Right, so the, that, that project is focusing, um, this is a project happening indeed at UW, and it's focusing on a problem called transcription, which is just, I guess, what it sounds like. It's taking a recording of a performance and generating a score, and ideally also remembering not just the score, but the velocities of everything, you know, what happened. Um, we're working on that too, it's a very hard problem, um, and uh, I think the distinction here is that these models, um, to have more data to train models like these, we probably need to solve at least partially the transcription problem, so we can take audio, and understand what's happening inside of it, kind of understand the piano articulation that generated the audio. Um, but these, these models are generating new pieces, so it's... it's so it's they really, don't care about the transcription in some sense? Your models don't... No, they know nothing about notes. They see piano rolls. Yeah. So, uh, sure, I guess that ends. Um, so a big part of performing is actually adhering to some structure, playing with some other people so that uh, listeners could anticipate what you are playing, in, or some structure of what you are playing. So what uh, I heard here mostly lacked the structure. It had some kind of local temporal aspect of playing on a piano. That sounded good, but it, mostly most of the example didn't have a good grasp of harmony progression and so on. So is it possible to impose this kind of expectations uh, for the form of music? The, the yeah, the yeah, it is. It's possible and it's extremely hard. Um, I think this, the, the word structure ends up coming up um, on you know, the second half an hour of every discussion about this problem. And, and actually, it's something that we're like, obsessively aware of. And furthermore, this idea of missing structure or inferring structure is there when we try to generate text. It's there when we try to, um, even, even doing something like, uh, you've probably seen style transfer where you can take your photograph and make it look like Picasso. You know what I mean? Like you see these, you know, like, these models are, are only working at a very surface level as well. They're not modifying the geometry of the face in the way that Picasso did. And the, the samples, these unconditional samples that I played, yeah, they're just kind of like blurting out like, you know, 15 seconds of something. And even, even over the span of the 15 seconds, if you listen closely, if you look, listen online, they, they diverge and go do something else. So there's a really strong connection between structure and conditioning. So in some sense, I think, uh, you can think of jazz improvisation as conditioned on the chord changes. Like, I don't think most, at least the jazz, the jazz that I've played, we kind of agree in advance what the chords are going to be. You know, we're going to play rhythm changes, or we're going to play, you know, we're going to play like, you know, Charlie Parker blues changes. And in some sense, that's already decided, right? And then we're we're working within that structure. So we can always do that with these models. We can always just say, hey, you know, here are some chord changes and condition on these chord changes, right? Um, that's, that's already a solved problem. I think more interesting would be for these models to actually learn by listening to a lot of jazz. It looks like there are five or six archetypical kinds of chord changes that are used in jazz. And that, that remains, I think, 
We can all kind of smell it, like we think we might get there, but we haven't gotten there. It's, it's really hard. The, the, gen, auto, the generated music that you'll hear by AI, the better it sounds <laughs> with the state of the art now, probably the more structure was built in by the programmer one way or the other. So, uh, great work. I've been a big fan of the okay. Chrome Music Lab, and I have a few friends at Google Creative, uh, and uh, the work that you're doing with AI. Um, I am uh, not very familiar with machine learning. I'm trying to learn it, and, I've, and a lot of musicians, I mean, this is totally inaccessible to them, the technology. Where would you recommend to go, which books to pick, or courses to take to learn so I can create I, my own models. I would look at, so at Cadenze, which is a, like online um, programming yeah. training for musicians and artists. Um, if you're um, knowledgeable about um, music software like Ableton, then we have an Ableton plugin for playing with Ensign. So as, you, know, you can interact with Ensign in a much more sort of musically intuitive way if you know Ableton by using the plugin. And also I think, I think it's our job to do a better job of building interface points for musicians that don't code to be able to play with these ideas. And that turns out, by the way, in, in a separate talk, is how hard is it to build out an open source community? It's very hard. And you probably make a lot of dumb mistakes because you're not really listening very well. And so we didn't do a very good job in the first few months of actually listening to what the community wanted. Um, and we've been trying to just like adapt and understand what they want and do a better job of providing. Like, like one answer is we haven't done enough to help you. Right? We can talk offline about this if you like. Yeah. Um, I, I think we're going to have to um, keep moving forward, so um, let's give Doug another round of applause.